In this video, we dive deeper into the first of the three main deadly virtues from duty ethics, unconditional love. Love is one of the most conflicted words in the English language. Dictionary.com alone has 28 entries listed for love. The Greeks actually had six different words, not just one, like we have. Eros, or sexual passion. Eros was viewed as a dangerous, fiery, and irrational form of love that could take hold of you and possess you. Eros involved a loss of control that frightened the Greeks. Philia, or friendship, showing loyalty to your friends. Ludius, or playful affection, referred to the playful affection between children or young lovers. Agape, universal brotherly love. This was a love that you extended to all people, whether family members or distant strangers. Pragma, long-standing love, the deep understanding that developed between long-married couples. It was about making compromises to help the relationship work over time and showing patience and tolerance. Philousia, self-love. There are two types, unhealthy narcissism, where you become self-obsessed, and healthy self-esteem. As Aristotle said, all friendly feelings for others are an extension of man's feelings for himself. Of these six loves, which are we talking about when we talk about God's love? It is generally understood that when we are talking about love in a religious context, we are talking about agape, or God's universal love. As you can imagine, eternalism with its ontological perspective of God inside the box has a very different perspective of God's love compared to the opposite God outside the box perspective of historical Christianity. C.S. Lewis said, If I may dare the biological image, God is a host who deliberately creates his own parasites, causes us to be that we may exploit and take advantage of him. Herein is love. This is the diagram of love himself, the inventor of all loves. C.S. Lewis compares divine love to a sickness where God is a host with an infinite supply, and we are dependent parasites taking advantage of him. From the perspective of historical Christianity, this model of comparing divine love to a sickness, where parasites take advantage of the host, is also the model advocated for us as mortals to follow as well. Mother Teresa said, Christ's love for us will give us strength and urge us to spend ourselves for him. Let the sisters and the people eat you up. We have no right to refuse our life to others in whom we contact Christ. Notice, according to this perspective of historical Christianity, yourself should be spent completely for others. We should let the people eat us up. Notice why. Out of duty, we have no right to do otherwise. Can you imagine your life if you implement this consistently? Various forms of this have even incorrectly crept in among Latter-day Saint thinking causing many people to burn out and leave the church, saying, It may be true, but it's not a very happy life letting other people eat me up. Only it isn't true, and they are leaving the wrong church based on the wrong doctrine and the wrong ontology. This apostate version of love has become an all-powerful God in itself. It has become the universal, unconditional, get-out-of-jail-free card, taking over everything it touches, becoming a law unto itself thanks to duty ethics. What started out as God is love actionable through the atonement, has become love is God. If you get God wrong, you'll get love wrong. If you get love wrong, you'll get God wrong. Should it surprise us then that apostate Christianity gets both God and love wrong? God is love has become love is God. Historical Christianity's version of divine love is clearly primacy of consciousness. The Swedish theologian Anders Nygren wrote about this version of love opposite to eternalism's perspective. He said, Fellowship with God is not governed by law, but by love. He also said, God's love allows no limits to be set for it by the character or conduct of man. The difference between the worthy and the unworthy, the righteous and the sinner, sets no bounds to his love. So with this version of love, righteousness no longer matters. There's no difference between worthy and unworthy. This is free grace repackaged as unconditional love. He continues, Love loves the unlovable, for sinners are lovely because they are loved. They are not loved because they are lovely. If this is the case, who can you think of that is the most unlovely, unlovable person in existence? Wouldn't Satan be the most loved person of everyone? The issue comes down to, does love create value, or is love a response to value, based on cause and effect of something real? Let's consider the children's book, No Matter What. 
It's a secular portrayal of this version of unconditional historical Christian love. The book starts out with the question, Will large love small forever, no matter what? Paraphrasing the plot of this children's book, it starts with small feeling grim and grumpy. Small throws a tantrum and trashes its room. When Small's parent, Large, asks, What's the matter? Small replies, I'm grim and grumpy, and I don't think you love me at all. Large simply replies, Grumpy or not, I'll always love you, no matter what. Not convinced and testing boundaries, Small asks if it were something meaner, like a grizzly bear. Would Large still love Small? The answer, of course, is, no matter what. Small again, not convinced, asked if it were something grosser, like a squishy bug. Would Large still love Small? The answer, of course, is no matter what. Small again, not convinced, asked if it were something both more dangerous and gross, like a toothy crocodile. Would Large still love Small? The answer, of course, is no matter what. And so on. No matter what is the same thing as saying unconditionally. What do you think of this story? Although the book is serious in its heartfelt sentiment portraying unconditional love, a serious analysis of its implications exposes the hidden disastrous consequences. A grumbly little fox can show any bad attitude it wills. Attitude doesn't matter. The little terror willfully trashes its room. Behavior doesn't matter. It changes its identity to something meaner. Identity doesn't matter. Meanness doesn't matter, so try grossness. Again, Identity still doesn't matter. Try a combination of mean and gross. Same answer. Identity still doesn't matter. Small is loved no matter what. Happy ending, right? Saying nothing matters is really the same thing as saying anything goes. Like most overly sentimental stories, the book stops short in depicting the real probable outcome. As if when Small figures out nothing matters, the bad attitude, the bad behavior, the meanness, the grossness will somehow stop and it will be all hugs and kisses from then on. It's not hard to imagine what happens as Small becomes a teenager and then an adult after years of growing up without any boundaries. No laws, no governance, this is pure willfulness from everyone who believes this nonsense. This is just free grace repackaged as unconditional love. So Eternalism added a more reality-based alternate ending. Eternalism's alternate ending says, Once Small figured out there were no conditions or boundaries, Small did whatever Small wanted, whenever Small wanted, without any consequences. The contradiction of love loves the unlovable, no matter what, is the same thing as unconditional love. Most destructively of all, Small intuitively knows that when unconditional love is applied to a person, that person loses their identity. When Small tests all potential boundaries and can't find any, Small is rightly confused. I love you for large and small turned into I love Y, where Y is just a generic placeholder variable, since the love has nothing to do with any attribute or identity of the person being loved. Small learned that unconditional love destroys a person because apparently Small could just as easily be replaced by a bear, a bug, or a crocodile. In the end, Small is gone and knows it. Small knows Small is losing its identity and fighting desperately to keep it somehow. Mother Teresa said, Love, in order to survive, must be nourished by sacrifices, especially the sacrifice of self. Charity to be fruitful must cost us. This love should flow from self-sacrifice, and it must be felt to the point of hurting. He wants us to love one another, to give ourselves to each other until it hurts. Give until it hurts, until you feel the pain. So this describes how true love must destroy yourself in self-sacrifice. Love must also be painful. What started out with, I love you, now becomes, X loves you. Because you must remove the I from the equation, there is no I anymore because you must self-sacrifice yourself. But wait, it isn't really about the other person either. Saint and sinner, worthy and unworthy, are loved exactly the same. Since it has nothing to do with the person showing love because they sacrificed themselves, and it has nothing to do with the person receiving the love because it has nothing to do with anything about them, it now becomes X loves Y. This is still not enough, though. Remember, this false version of love must give until it hurts. The more pain you feel out of duty, the more they call it love. It now becomes 
X dutifully sacrifices itself for Y. What was once I love you doesn't really look like love anymore at all. Do you see how this corrupt version of love just destroyed everything? There is no I anymore because I self-sacrificed itself. There is no you anymore because it has nothing to do with any attributes you may or may not possess. There is no love anymore. What was once called love is now called pain inflicted out of duty. Joseph Fielding McConkie said, It is not an unusual thing to have students cover willful disobedience in the blanket of God's love and to advance the idea of a universal salvation that sounds dangerously like that advocated by Lucifer in the councils of heaven. Elder Boyd K. Packer said, Some members wonder why their priesthood leaders will not accept them just as they are and simply comfort them in what they call pure Christian love. Pure Christian love, the love of Christ, does not presuppose approval of all conduct. Surely the ordinary experiences of parenthood teach that one can be consumed with love for another and yet be unable to approve unworthy conduct. We cannot, as a church, approve unworthy conduct or accept into full fellowship individuals who live or who teach standards that are grossly in violation of that which the Lord requires of Latter-day Saints. If we, out of sympathy, should approve unworthy conduct, it might give present comfort to someone, but would not ultimately contribute to that person's happiness. So if divine love cannot be called unconditional, what would we call it then? Divine love is actionable and proportional love. As Shakespeare said, they do not love that do not show their love. Divine love is a verb proportional to the actions taken. Revisiting our gospel target chart, the gospel target is proportional love, love according to law, proportional to the commandments that are kept. Notice the conditional nature of divine love in John 15.10, where it says, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. What would the undershooting version be? This would be bad love. Love of money, love of lies, love of wickedness. This destructive love destroys everything it touches. As it says in 2 Timothy, Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. This bad love is designed to destroy the wicked who are not religiously inclined. So what would be the overshooting mark? This would be unconditional love where evil gets ignored. This deadly overshooting of unconditional love is designed to destroy those otherwise righteous persons who are religiously inclined because it essentially says anything goes. The Book of Mormon prophet Alma spoke out against this anything goes mentality when he taught that mercy cannot rob justice. Church leaders have also taught about the conditional nature of love and the absolute nature of law. Elder Russell M. Nelson said, In today's world trembling with terror and hatred, our knowledge of divine love is of utmost importance. While divine love can be called perfect, infinite, enduring, and universal, it cannot be characterized as unconditional. The word does not appear in the scriptures. The full flower of divine love and our greatest blessings from that love are conditional, predicated upon our obedience to eternal law. Elder Dallin H. Oak said, Some seem to value God's love because of their hope that His love is so great and so unconditional that it will mercifully excuse them from obeying His laws. In contrast, those who understand God's plan for His children know that God's laws are invariable, which is another great evidence of His love for His children. Mercy cannot rob justice, and those who obtain mercy are they who have kept the covenant and observed the commandment. If anyone thinks that godly or parental love for an individual grants the loved one license to disobey the law, he or she does not understand either love or law. In other words, the kingdom of glory to which the final judgment assigns us is not determined by love, but by the law that God has invoked in His plan to qualify us for eternal life, the greatest of all the gifts of God. The tree of life, from Lehi's vision, is conditional. Elder Bednar said, The central feature in Lehi's dream is the tree of life, a representation of the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thus the birth, life, and atoning sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ are the greatest manifestations of God's love for his children. The fruit on the tree is a symbol for the blessings of the atonement. Partaking of the fruit of the tree represents the receiving of ordinances and covenants, whereby the atonement can become fully efficacious in our lives. Notice the conditional nature of the love of God represented by the tree of life, the actionable blessings of the atonement represented by the fruit on the tree, 
are only conditionally gained by those who follow the path, clinging to the iron rod and enduring to the end. The fruit is not available in vending machines in the lobby of the great and spacious building, nor are there street vendors peddling the fruit all along the path. It can't be found, strewn about everywhere in the mists of darkness for people to stumble over and just pick up. The fruit is only conditionally available to those who do the work to walk the path, stay on the path, and arrive at the tree to gather the fruit for themselves. Elder Christofferson said, Christ died not to save indiscriminately, but to offer repentance. In Alma 43.13 it says, Therefore, according to justice, the plan of redemption could not be brought about only on conditions of repentance. In Doctrine and Covenants 138 it says, And the great and wonderful love made manifest by the Father and the Son in the coming of the Redeemer into the world, that through His atonement and by obedience to the principles of the gospel, mankind might be saved. If the tree of life representing the actionable love of God through the atonement is conditional, what do you think it means to love your enemies, as referenced in Matthew 5.44? Our perspective on how we interpret loving our enemies will mostly depend on which ontology we are coming from, the absolute emotional love of duty or the conditional actionable love from value ethics. Reading Matthew 5.44 from a duty ethics perspective would imply, But I say unto you, love your enemies unconditionally, the same as your friends and family. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Reading Matthew 5.44 from a value ethics perspective would imply, But I say unto you, show love to your enemies conditionally, differently than your friends and family. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Many people misunderstand the commandment in Matthew 5.44 as a directive to psychologically love enemies instead of showing actionable love in an attempt to change them. President Brigham Young, who passed through the mob violence of Kirtland, Missouri, and Nauvoo, had first-hand practical experience in dealing with enemies of the most violent nature. Consequently, he understood the mistaken misapplication of this teaching common to historical Christianity. He said, It is written, Love your enemies. I do not think the term was any more misapplied than when the apostles wrote, Love your enemies, for I do not believe a word of that. Love your enemies? What, love hell? When people do that, they get where the devils are. If it had been written, Love the spirits God has placed in tabernacles and try to reclaim them and do them good and pray for those who despitefully use you, I would feed and clothe them, take peculiar care of them, and place them where they would not hurt anybody. You may think I am disputing the Bible. If you understood what the Lord means when He talks about loving His children, you would understand that He does not love them as they are now, for He hates and is angry with the wicked. President Joseph F. Smith spoke on this subject when he said, There is a difference between the love we should bear towards our enemies and that we should bear towards our friends. I do not love them so that I would take them into my bosom, or invite them to associate with my family or that I would give my daughters to their embraces, nor my sons to their councils. I do not love them so well that I would invite them to the councils of the priesthood and the ordinances of the house of God to scoff and jeer at sacred things which they do not understand, nor would I share with them the inheritance that God my Father has given me in Zion. But we do not love to associate with our enemies, and I do not think the Lord requires us to do it. If He does, He will have to reveal it, for I cannot find it anywhere revealed. President Brigham Young said, I have not much love for them, only in the gospel. I would cause them to repent, if I could, and make them good men and a good community. I have no fellowship for their avarice, blindness, and ungodly actions. To be great is to be good before the heavens and before all good men. I will not fellowship the wicked in their sins, so help me God. President Brigham Young also said, Do I love murderers and mobocrats as I do good men? No. Do I pray for them? Yes that the Lord would judge them out of their own mouths, and that speedily. This brings us to a discussion on judging. Doesn't showing love to friends and family differently than how we show love to enemies require judgment on our part? Are we commanded not to judge? Consider the following scripture from both a duty ethics perspective and a value ethics perspective. From a duty ethics perspective, Matthew 7.1 would read something like, Judge not, no matter what, that ye be not judged. Joseph Smith translated Matthew 7.1 to a more value ethics perspective, which says, Judge not unrighteously, that ye be not judged, 
but judge righteous judgment. Many people, including many Latter-day Saints, misinterpret Matthew 7.1 and run with it, ignoring the additional context in the rest of the sermon where Christ said, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Christ also said, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. The obvious question arising from the apparent contradiction between Matthew 7.1 and the rest of the sermon is, how can you determine dogs and swine, sheep and wolves, unless you use your brain to judge? Can you separate the fruit from the tree? The obvious answer is you can't. The Book of Mormon adds much needed clarification. The Book of Mormon describes how not only are we commanded to judge, we are also told how to do it, and how it is quite simply done. In Moroni 7 it says, For behold, my brethren, it is given unto you to judge, that ye may know good from evil. And the way to judge is as plain, that ye may know with a perfect knowledge, as the daylight is from the dark night. For behold, the Spirit of Christ is given to every man, that he may know good from evil. Wherefore I show unto you the way to judge. For everything which inviteth to do good, and to persuade to believe in Christ, is sent forth by the power and gift of Christ. Wherefore ye may know with a perfect knowledge it is of God. Elder Oaks discussed this apparent contradiction, explaining a definition problem with the word judge. He said, I have been puzzled that some scriptures command us not to judge, and others instruct us that we should judge, and even tell us how to do it. The key is to understand that there are two kinds of judging, final judgments, which we are forbidden to make, and intermediate judgments, which we are directed to make, but upon righteous principles. The effect of one mortal's attempting to pass final judgment on another mortal is analogous to the effect on an athlete and observers if we could proclaim the outcome of an athletic contest with certainty while it was still underway. A similar reason forbids our presuming to make final judgments on the outcome of any person's lifelong mortal contest. Elder Oaks rightly points out the two different and contradictory meanings bundled up in the word judging, where condemnation is a final judgment and using our reason is an intermediate judgment. Final judgment during mortal probation doesn't make sense, because the race is not yet over. What if God had passed final judgment on Saul or Alma the Younger before they repented of their evil ways? Elder Oaks continues, We must, of course, make judgments every day in the exercise of our moral agency, but we must be careful that our judgments of people are intermediate and not final. Thus, our Savior's teachings contain many commandments we cannot keep without making intermediate judgments of people. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland said, In this regard, there is sometimes a chance for misunderstanding, especially among young people who may think we are not supposed to judge anything, that we are never to make a value assessment of any kind. We have to help each other with that because the Savior makes it clear that in some situations, we have to judge. We are under obligation to judge. As when he said, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. That sounds like a judgment to me. The unacceptable alternative is to surrender to postmodern moral relativism, which, pushed far enough, declares that ultimately nothing is eternally true or especially sacred, and therefore no one position on any given issue matters more than any other. And in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that simply is not true. In this process of evaluation, we are not called on to condemn others, but we are called upon to make decisions every day that reflect judgment. We hope good judgment. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to the Christian Eternalism YouTube channel and visit www.christianeternalism.org.